My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog. And if you guys want to support the show, you can do so in a couple of ways. You can uh, write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today the man with the answers is going to be Rick Tumlinson. Rick is a legendary visionary, evangelist, and dare I say a trench warrior for the privatization and commercialization of space. He has a very rich and colorful biography, one that's a little bit too long for me to share in depth here with you, but let me just point you towards some brief highlights, uh, which include uh, uh, leasing the Russian Mir space station, helping send the first space tourist, Denis Tito, and starting a number of amazing organizations and companies, uh, such as the XPRIZE Foundation, the Space Frontier Foundation, Lunacorp, Mircorp, Orbiter, Orbital Outfitters, and uh, most recently, the New Worlds Institute. So without further ado, welcome, Rick, and thanks very much for taking time to be with us today. It's my pleasure. I'm looking uh, forward to having a good chat. Fantastic. So I kind of tried to abbreviate your very long biography in a few sentences, but if we try and push that even a step further, and I ask you to do that instead of me, how would you put yourself in a couple of sentences at the most? Well, one of the first things I want to do is correct. Uh, I want to make sure you, uh, uh, your viewers understand I helped with some of those projects. Uh, I was on the founding board of the X Prize. Uh, the original idea was uh, my friend Peter Diamandis. Um, and um, I've just been very privileged to be at the right place at the right time. And, and to have people um, allow me to work with them to do some, some exciting things. Um, I'm not a rocket scientist. I just get to hang out with them. And, uh, you know, once in a while, um, you know, I come from fairly modest beginnings. I'm not silver spoon by any means, uh, or like plastic drive-in fork. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where if you, if you don't jump up and down on the table and scream and throw furniture and drool and yell at people too much, and once in a while you make sense, people will let you hang around. And if you hang around and you keep your ears and your eyes open, um, you can actually acquire a tiny bit of wisdom. So I've just been very lucky. Um, and um, I've had a hell of a, a good time and a good run working with a lot of great people. So again, if we are to box you in two sentences, <laughs> who is Rick Tumlinson? Rick Tumlinson is the descendant of pioneers who wants to help create the future pioneers who are going to go open the solar system and expand life beyond the earth. That's why I'm here. The whole reason I exist is to make sure that this species and the life of the earth expands into the universe. So what's your biggest dream, Rick? Well, that would be it. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, the biggest dream you know, we are limited in our perceptions by the amount of time we are actually here on the planet perceiving. So uh, my biggest dream would be to see this be uh, an irreversible thing in my lifetime. To actually see the first people declaring that they live somewhere out there in my lifetime. That would be the mark of success. I will have, along with my friends and associates and fellow warriors, made it happen. And what would be the mark of irreversibility then? Irreversibility. Well, nothing is irreversible in the absolute, but the first steps to irreversibility would be people who are living on the moon, Mars, or a phrase I've been using a lot lately, free space, which is the place between where gravity is not a consideration and you have to create your own. People living out there who consider those places to be their home. In other words, they're not there for a shift. They're not there for a tour of duty. They're not going somewhere else when they're done doing what they're doing where they are. They are where they're going home to. And that place where they live 
is a place that they plan to hand to their descendants or make better for their children. That's when it's a home. So when people see those places as their home, that will be the mark that human civilization has begun to expand beyond the planet. So, Rick, where did you get the bug for all of this? I mean, I, I've been spending a lot of time getting ready for this interview. Uh, I watched uh, last night Orphans of Apollo, which is an absolutely fantastic movie that I recommend to my audience that they should watch. Because I believe actually that chapter of uh, space exploration and, and even uh, out of this world entrepreneurship uh, perhaps has not gotten its fair share in, in history and in, in, in the public kind of awareness quite yet. So, so perhaps you can share a, a little, a few details with us about that and tell us maybe even before that, how did you even get the bug to begin with? Well, there's an hour and a half right there. Um, but um, in particular with Orphans of Apollo, uh, I do want to uh, congratulate Michael Potter, he did a great job, uh, uh, masterful uh, program. Uh, those of us who were sort of the subjects of it had almost nothing to do with how it was put together. Uh, and I think it looks, uh, it looks great. I would like to see the end of it uh, maybe uh, tweaked a little bit. Some things have happened since then um, um, that would maybe modernize it a little bit, but I'd love to see it reintroduced. Um, uh, it's a great production. Unfortunately, the, the release of it into the world was a little bit haphazard. And I think if it could be put out there, it would help people understand. Um, there was uh, some precursor activities, by the way, that aren't covered uh, in Orphans of Apollo. Um, most people don't realize, um, who, who, who even know that we took over the mirror uh, for about nine months, um, they don't realize that our goal was asteroid mining. <laughs> um, so here we were back in the late 90s looking at how to get to the point of mining asteroids and um, it's kind of a funny story but the, uh, uh, prior to that period Walt Anderson who is one of the unsung heroes of our cause he's, he gave uh, the first unfettered money to the, the guys who founded the International Space University for example he helped fund the Space Frontier Foundation he was one of the first uh, uh, rich guys who put his money where his dreams were. And um, he had put me a, a few years ahead of that in charge of a thing called FINES, the Foundation for the International Non-Government Development of Space. Um, and I have to tell you, it was a dream job. It was the best job ever. Uh, I was put in charge of $25 million and told to give away half of the interest, assuming 10% growth, every year to cool space projects that would help open the frontier. And I had an office on Ventura Boulevard. I had a travel budget. I um, had a little team working with me that was uh, Walt Anderson and, and Gus Gardellini. And uh, by the way, the way we reduced our paperwork was we had a rule and we told everybody in the community that if you asked for money, you were automatically banned from getting any. We have to find you. Uh, now, yeah, what that meant was that we had to keep our ears to the ground, and that was sort of my job, to find where the great projects were. It also meant we didn't have much paperwork, and it helped us do staff. Um, but it was like a job out of a, I've had so many jobs that were like something out of a Robert Heinlein science fiction novel. Um, and um, so we funded things like laser launch research. Uh, we funded uh, telerobotics with uh, Red Whitaker and Carnegie Mellon, uh, solar sail research, three return to the moon conferences. We founded, uh, uh, funded uh, hearings, uh, uh, unofficial hearings in the House in, or in the Senate, uh, where the first time somebody heard about commercial space facilities, um, uh, things like that, uh, on and on and on. And, um, it was just a real privilege because I was able to give away basically at the peak, I think we were giving away one and a half, two million dollars a year. And um, I was able at that point to start funding. And this comes all the way back around to my current company. Um, I funded some work by Dr. John Lewis, who wrote the book Mining the Sky and Rain of Iron and Ice, 
uh, which were the books that started the whole asteroid mining thing. And I was able to give him, I think it was about a half million dollars at one point to do research on how you extract metals from asteroids. And he hired a gentleman um, from uh, Australia named Mark Saunter, who's one of the top experts, and they were working on that. Now, we also then hired a couple of people to look at the mirror and whether it could be saved from uh, the orbit. Now, just to give you a little philosophical context here, if you're a frontier-oriented person and you believe in, in the frontier approach, you don't throw anything away. You recycle everything. Everything is precious to you. Um, and that's the philosophy. You don't throw away perfectly good space stations. And so we hired some people to look at it um, and, and tell us whether or not it was savable and what technology we might use to save it. And it was uh, Joe Carroll, um, who was famous for having flown tethers, and Vladimir Sirometnikov, who is a uh, well-known uh, to the Russians uh, as the guy who sort of created his, I guess the biggest thing he's known for is the docking adapters that are still used on the space station. Uh, and they looked at flying a thing called an electrodynamic tether, which would create a very small electrical charge opposite that of the Earth and would slowly push the mirror up at a very, very, very low rate of pressure but 24-7, 365, and that would mean that we wouldn't have to spend a lot of money on tankers to carry propellant to, to thrust and keep it in orbit. It's an absolutely brilliant idea. Basically, I think he was explaining it as a sail that floats on plasma, on, on the electromagnetic plasma from the Earth or, fr or from the Sun. I can't remember. Yeah, basically, it's just... It's just like two magnets. It's getting an opposite charge with the Earth, and it pushes it, but it's ever so slight. And we got a great report on it. Um, and at that point, we were still thinking that we were originally, what our original goal was, was that we were going to push the mirror to a very high orbit and shut it down, put it in mothballs, mm -hmm. and then figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Um, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about, Walt and I were out having drinks at a sushi restaurant and, uh, um, you know, and he's, and I said to him, I said, do you think, you know, you'd like to have a space station? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I think we can do that. And, <laughs> um, and it was because we had this information. Now, the issue had started a couple of years before in 1995, um, and this is going to be a little convoluted bit of a story, but it'll bring us back to the point you want to be. I was honored to be able to testify in front of the House Space Subcommittee. and In Congress. In Congress, yeah. Um, and uh, what had happened was we had spent several years in the Space Frontier Foundation fighting against um, the space station. Uh, and this all is very ironic, but it ties up in a very interesting bow nowadays. But um, we were against the space station because President Reagan had announced that the space station was going to be finished in 1992. And it was going to cost eh, around six billion dollars. Yeah. So we uh, um, kind of didn't believe that. Uh, and we also believed that things like facilities and operations in space should be conducted by the people, not by the government. Um, and we fought against the space station uh, for several years until we actually got close to killing it by one vote. And what's very interesting is my, my friends on the other side, the, the NASA guys, the ones who are fighting for the space station, will have conversations now. And it's kind of funny because they say, we saved the space station by one vote. And from our perspective, we nearly killed it by one vote. Uh, and both of us feel good about that. <laughs> but, and that was the Space Frontier Foundation um, moving very powerfully and directly. And 
you know, when things are very close, small groups have a lot of power. And so what happened was having lost that vote, but really gotten so close, we ended up, a fellow named Jim Muncie and myself, working through a third party, had a call placed to the NASA administrator, Dan Golden. And we, uh, through a third party friend of ours, and told him, look, we'll walk away from fighting against the space station if you will support this new rocket that's being tested out in New Mexico called the DCX. Now, at the time, the DCX was the rock star of our field. We had been through all of this bloated government stuff. We had realized the space shuttle was way more expensive than it was pitched to be. The space station was going off the rails in its budget. And here was this little tiny rocket um, that was a project run by a guy named Pete Warden. Um, and at the same time um, that all of these bad things were happening, here was this little rocket that would fly straight up and do all these interesting maneuvers in space. Um, it would fly sideways. It was, it was wonderful. Um, in fact, I think, I do actually. Here's a model of the, uh, the DCX. Fantastic. And the DCX, the, the joke used to be that it was a rocket that flew up and landed on its tail like God and Robert Heinlein intended. Um, and yeah, I've gotten this one signed by a lot of people that were involved. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to work on that team. Um, the thing about the DCX, though, was it was under budget. It represented all of the new approaches to things that many of us were interested in seeing. Low cost, reusable, 100%, etc. Now, they had just run out of money at about the time of the space station battle. And the people at New Mexico had, and it was an Air Force project, the people in New Mexico had literally locked the gate and told them, you're done. You have no more money. So having just fought the space station battle, we had a little bit of leverage and we traded Dan Golden fighting against the space station for him to save the DCX. And what he did was he shipped some money over and DCX became DCXA and became a NASA project at that point. Now, yeah, they screwed it up later and, and they had an unfortunate accident. Uh, Pete Conrad was one of the leaders of that project, a great guy. Um, and so for a few years now after that, we had pulled away from fighting the space station. And now we're in this place where we're fighting for what we call cheap access to space. Now, there was a, a fellow around at that time. Uh, I'm giving you the history here, but uh, it's probably something people should hear. There was a fellow around named Tom Rogers. Tom Rogers was this old gentleman who had been in the Kennedy administration, a guy who could literally pull off a seersucker suit, you know, the white suit with the little blue stripes. Um, and he was legendary for being a visionary leader of the old school. He was one of the guys who said, why don't we recycle the big orange tanks on the bottom of the space shuttle? Mm -hmm. And in fact... He had just gotten President Reagan a few years ago before this to sign a deal. Nobody ever capitalized on this, to sign a deal handing over two of those tanks to the private sector in space as salvage. But unfortunately, there was no Elon Musk or anybody else flying at that point, so nobody ever got to use them. So Tom Rogers sits down with me after we've backed off of trying to kill the space station and we've worked on DC and we've got DCX happening and he sat down with me at a couch and Tom was legendary. He had a funny voice and he was like, well, Rick, you, 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 you almost killed the station, but you didn't. You, you worked on DCX. You got that thing flying. Yeah, that's good, good stuff. But now you got this, uh, this lemon up there, this uh, lemon called the space station. Uh, what are you going to do about that, Rick? How, how are you going to take that lemon and, uh, Turn it into lemonade. And <laughs> anyone who knew him is probably chuckling because that's how he talked. He had that kind of voice. And how are you going to make that into lemonade, Rick? What are you going to do about that? And so it got me thinking. And, and a couple of years later, I testified. And my testimony was called Alpha Town. 
Now, the idea of Alpha Town was, okay, we've got a space station. And let's think of it as a federal facility on the frontier, much like um, a fort. And by the way, I will tell you, many of your listeners and and viewers I know are uh, in other countries and such. So forgive me if I use um, American analogies and American history references. It's the one I know. Um, If I lived in your country, I'd probably use your references, but I have to go with what I know. So in the Old West, the government would build a fort on the frontier way out there, and then they would secure the transportation route to and from the frontier for resupply. And what would happen would be a trading post would spring up around that fort. They would sell stuff to the guys in the fort, the people in the fort, and then they would transport stuff back to civilization using that transportation route. In space, the analogy would be, at that time, the space station and the space shuttle. So how could you use that space station to leverage the private sector doing things? In the old analogy, in the old west, if you cut to today, and many of you probably see these in your cities like Toronto and other places, downtown there'll be an old fort. Fort York. Yes, little museum pieces, you know, now that have done their job. They were like the kernel around which everything grew. Now, why couldn't we do that in space? And so in Alpha Town, I suggested that in 1995, and I said a, a few basic things. Number one, these are not in order, but that all power to the space station should be generated by a central utility, like a space solar power satellite, sending power in space, not to the Earth, but in space, to the space station and to telecommunication satellites. Then they could get rid of all those big solar panels and just have a big utility. And once we get good at it, then we could send it down to the Earth. Mm -hmm. Number two, any expansion of capability in the space should be done using commercial facilities. Now, we didn't have Bigelow yet, but like private space stations or private modules. And number three, most importantly, I said all transportation to and from the station should be provided by commercial companies so that the tax dollars being invested in the station could leverage a new industry and the people in that new industry now could start to offer rides to go to other places and do other things. So that was 95. Now I want to be very clear. This wasn't me having some brilliant genius idea all by myself. I was speaking for myself and a lot of my comrades a lot of my friends, and uh, I just happen to have the microphone. Now, that was 95, and we set about in the Space Frontier Foundation and others to change the laws and create a scenario where eventually a guy named Elon Musk and Orbital Science Company and Jeff Bezos and these others would have the ability. But those guys didn't just spring up on their own. And we can come back to that in a minute. The other part of it was I had said that we should not throw away perfectly good space stations, that we should recycle everything. And it was part of the frontier philosophy. Well, a few friends of mine later pointed out that the mirror was about to be deorbited. And why not recycle it? So we began a campaign called uh, KMA, Keep Mirror Alive. I know it's a fun acronym, but... It was called Keep Mirror Alive, and we fought and eventually started getting to the point, because I was working on the Fines Project with that funding, of, well, maybe we could put some money where our dreams were and actually um, save the mirror. So that was when the mirror project started. Um, I went to Walt Anderson and we began the conversations and this, the rest of this, most of this is in the documentary. However, one of the funny things uh, that happened was, as I told you, uh, we were very much into the idea of asteroid mining. Now, a few years before we had held the announcement party at the Roosevelt hotel in Hollywood. And at the announcement party, we had put posters on the wall, large posters, featuring Pat Rawlings' artwork about 
asteroid mining. And in between them were posters of icebergs. And these were big posters. And the point was that at that time, Walt Anderson was developing a company that was going to tow icebergs to arid countries and sell them water. And he wanted to show that he could do big projects. At the same time, we wanted to very subtly send the signal that at some point we would be mining asteroids. Now, what happened was on the way to the announcement, Walt Anderson drove by a special effects store in Hollywood and he rented two fog machines because he thought it would be kind of cool to have sort of a layer of fog on the ground during the announcement of fines. And we weren't going to, we weren't, we loved inside jokes and we weren't going to say anything out loud about the asteroid mining. It was just going to be on the wall like a joke, a subtle little thing. And, uh, and I'll wrap this up here. But what happened was Walt got into the room prior to all the people coming in, turned on the fog machines, uh, like in, the, uh, like in the movie, he turned them from 9 to 11. You know, he turned them all the way up. And as people came into the reception, the room filled with fog all the way up to the ceiling. You couldn't see each other. They had to call the fire department. And everybody left the room, and we had to hold the announcement impromptu in the hall. So nobody saw the pictures of the asteroids and the icebergs on the wall. And so the whole joke was lost. And so there's all this fog is coming out, and then we announced fines. So the goal of MIR, MIR Corp, was to service satellites on orbit using little pods. We were talking to some people that were um, working, I think it was with the Ukrainians, perhaps, or was it the Russians? Might have been the Ukrainians. There was a little pod thing they were working on where they would go out, sort of like the one in 2001, and be able to grab satellites and move them around. And then we were going to work our way out to asteroids. So that was a bit of a long, circuitous story. It's kind of what I do. But um, Mir Corp was originally formed to mine asteroids. Absolutely fascinating. Now, going back to my original question here, which was, where did you get the bug? You told us that fascinating story behind the Mir space station lease agreement and how it all came about. But even before that, let's roll the tape even further, where did you get the bug yourself? I got the bug. The space bug. Yeah, I got the bug. Look, I was an asthmatic kid. Um, I was the son of a, a military sergeant uh, who had to work three jobs. Um, and um, I'm from a Texas family. We're not a wealthy family, but our family has roots uh, in the founding of Texas. We were in the, what would they call the first 300. My great-great-great-grandfather was the alcalde, which is like a mayor and a governor, um, that helped run uh, a part of Texas under Moses Austin. Wow. Uh, when they founded the state, he helped found a group called the Texas Rangers, um, got them their first guns. Uh, they, we have letters back and forth between him and Austin talking about men of character who will range the land. And, um, you know, uh, there were 38 Texas Rangers in my family over the years. And uh, my great, great, great grandfather died in the Alamo. Um, the, the sons of this guy, John, who was the governor, the alcalde, were the guys standing on the river that fired the cannon that started the Texas Revolution. Now, that's very important psychologically to where my head is. Uh, that was always very, uh, very big in my home. Uh, at the same time, my mother was English and I was raised in the UK. And I was um, surrounded by the legends and myths of knights and chivalry and all of that. And if you go into my other room here, um, you know, there's swords on the walls and maps, ancient maps of different parts of the world and things like that. So I grew up in that sense of history. Um, and yet at the same time, I did a lot of reading. I was an asthmatic kid, as I mentioned. So um, I was reading Heinlein and Clark and Asimov 
and um, having these dreams of what the future should be. Also, at the same time, the Apollo program was underway, and I was watching real people doing it, which meant that, of course, by the time I grew up, we were going to be doing a lot more. I'd be able to get to go. Um, and then you combine that with uh, flipping the channel on the TV set, and there's Captain Kirk, you know, and later on, Star Wars and all of this happening. And I'm thinking, okay, and in my mind as a kid, that all merges together and becomes one thing, the frontier, the science fiction of the future, and the real people doing it, the, the, the people with the right stuff. Now, I was naive enough to think that I might have a little pinch of the right stuff myself, but I also grew up as a bit of a rebel. Um, and so I had a tendency to cut out of classes and argue with my teachers because I thought I was smarter than they were, and then I would storm out of the classes and basically um, uh, turn down all of my uh, uh, scholarships because I was in love with a, a girl and so I stayed in the local area when we came back to the United States. I, I ended up in a school in the country. Um, uh, I walked in with an English accent wearing David Bowie boots and a David Bowie haircut um, into, a, into a school in, a, in the countryside in East Texas that was a rancher school, fell in love with a farmer's daughter and blew off all of my scholarships and decided to go to the junior college and this, you have to understand, was the 70s. Um, so I became expert in uh, certain things that are green and grow out of the ground. And, uh, you know, it was the psychedelic era. All of that stuff was going on. And I was a rebel. I just didn't want to fit in. I didn't want to, you know, do what the professor said and all of that. So all of it started to come together finally um, when uh, I was sitting cross-legged on the floor at Stephen F. Austin University, stoned, watching a guy named Timothy Leary give a lecture on space colonies. Because Timothy Leary, along with a lot of people in that period of time, had just read this amazing book called The High Frontier. And he's showing these pictures of cities in space. And I'm thinking, oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, a few weeks later, um, I was working tech in the, the, the school theater where I thought I was going to become a director because I had quit all of my science courses because I just got into such fights with all the professors and there were a lot more girls in the theater department. So uh, I'm working tech and doing lighting and we had a guest speaker named Gene Roddenberry. Wow. The creator of Star Trek. And I'm standing backstage with him at one moment and I'm by myself with him. And, um, and I asked him, and I said, what, I want to do something. I don't have the skills. I've, I've you know, dropped out of classes and this and that. I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, an astronaut. What can I do? I, I want to make Star Trek happen. And he said, you know what my old job was? And I, I said, no, I really, no. I, you know, um, and he said, um, I used to be an, a Los Angeles policeman. And, you know, he didn't say it exactly that way, but he said I was with LAPD. He was a cop. Wow. Before he wrote Star Trek. Um, and he said that to me and he said, look, you can do anything. You just have to stick with your dream and never, ever, ever give up. Never, ever let anybody tell you you can't do something or that you don't have the right skills. And so I stayed with it. And... Um, I thought originally that I was going to be uh, directing films about space. I was going to use that skill. Uh, I had learned how to shoot a video camera. I was going to, I was going to do the next uh, Cosmos um, after the original Carl Sagan one about Jerry O'Neill in space and, and all of that. Um, and then I ended up in New York City because the lady I was in love with got a job as an actress. Uh, I arrived in New York City. Um, I was going to open a theater. I was going to do Ray Bradbury plays and space theater for the first time. And I realized, I remember sitting on a dock on the Hudson Bay one night, looking at what I could see of the stars. Can't see a lot there. We call that combat astronomy um, in New York City. And 
I realized that I just wanted to dedicate my life to this. Now, at the time, there was no space organization in New York City. Um, there had been some people who tried, and uh, it hadn't come together. And so I organized a group that we called the L5 of New York City. Um, L5 stands for Lagrange Point Number 5, which, if you're looking at the gravitational forces between objects in space, there are certain areas, there are five of them, between and around the Earth and the Moon, where there's sort of a cancellation effect, in a sense. They're like eddy, eddies. They're places where if you put something, it's probably going to stay easier, where you might find asteroids, where you might be able to put a city if you're going to put a city in space. And L5 was the place that Dr. O'Neill had talked about. So I formed the L5 Society of New York, and we were able, we got turned down by the um, Hayden Planetarium, but there was an aircraft carrier called the Intrepid in the Hudson Bay, and the Hudson River, and they invited us in. And so we started having meetings on the aircraft carrier Intrepid. We were the only space organization with an aircraft carrier. Wow. And at the time, um, Dr. O'Neill was in Princeton, uh, a little while away from, from uh, New York City, and we started interacting with his organization and with Dr. O'Neill's uh, people, and we started having them as speakers. And he had a thing called the Space Studies Institute back then, uh, which is a bit of a different creature than the one that exists today. And um, these people were... They weren't just talking the talk. They were out trying to make it happen. And see, the thing with Dr. O'Neill was he didn't just write a book saying, you can go, you know, you can do it. Um, he actually started an organization and then held conferences to build on that. And we can come back around to that when we talk about New World's Institute later. Sure. But at the time, um, we started throwing these meetings and... We would have 150 people. We had amazing people coming in, like Freeman Dyson, and all these great people would come in and uh, talk. And um, I started to get to know people. Um, we started actually becoming one of the largest chapters of the L5 Society. Now, during that period of time, um, the aerospace companies were trying to get their space station funded. We hadn't started the fight yet. This for that. And they were trying to get people, these, these crazy L5ers who were like the wild, you know, people in the hills, you know, who were these radicals that were, let's go build colonies in space. And these people kind of came from the Robert Heinlein, you know, in fact, he was one of the leaders of L5, um, kind of crazy, let's go out there, libertarian approach. And there was another organization in Washington called the National Space Institute that had been founded by Werner von Braun. Okay, its job was to cheerlead for NASA. And the aerospace companies dearly wanted these crazy yet vibrant L5ers to work with this cheerleading organization. So they held out some money if the two organizations would merge and it worked, and they merged, and they became the National Space Society. Now, at the time, those of us who were very hardcore uh, O'Neillians, Jerry O'Neill followers, um, started looking at this and saying, hold it, this isn't right. There's something wrong here. The space station doesn't equal colonies in space. It's, it's a whole different thing. It's the government. It's centralized. And we were more about free enterprise and individualism. And so we, uh, at that point, uh, started to discuss where we would go and what we could do um, that would be more on the side of leading to civilization in space um, and yet could be a little more radical, let's say. Mm -hmm. So that's where the Space Frontier Foundation was born. Fascinating. And... and uh... Let me ask you this, perhaps now is the time to tell us the story of the pirate flag there that I see behind you. Is that somehow connected to your roots, to that pioneering spirit that, that you have 
both in your blood and in your head, as you said. Well, yeah, and what you can't see off camera is there's a Texas flag and a British flag over on the other side. Uh, I'm still looking for the cannon flag. Um, there was a famous flag, I, uh, as I mentioned with my ancestors, um, what started the Texas Revolution um, was that there was a cannon in this little town called Gonzales that had been left there. And Santa Ana, who was the dictator in Mexico, sent a troop of Mexican soldiers to get the cannon back. And they came up on a river, and on the other side of the river were a bunch of uh, Texicans, and they, uh, they had this one cannon, and they had a sheet, a bed sheet, with a picture of a cannon on it that said, come and take me. <laughs> And they fired the cannon and the Mexican soldiers ran away. And that's what started the Texas Revolution. Um, it's interesting because if you ever read a book called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Robert Heinlein. Robert Heinlein. The symbol of the revolution on the moon is a single cannon. It comes, I think, from the same story. Um, so that could have just as easily been hanging back here as the pirate flag. The pirate flag... Obviously, buccaneers are cool, and I grew up, you know, thinking they were pretty cool. I mean, yeah, they were kind of bloodthirsty, some of them, but uh, uh, the idea of the privateers, the uh, uh, being revolutionary, was pretty big. And if you recall, um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a thing called, there was a documentary that came out called The Pirates of Silicon Valley. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah, and it was about Steve Jobs and all of these guys. Um, and Microsoft, too. Yes, and Microsoft and the battles between them and all of that. Um, that's kind of when I first started really using the pirate flag. And so what I would do, and I still do, is whenever I would start a talk, I would say, welcome to the revolution, and I would drop the pirate flag over the front of the podium. Um, and it's just a thing. It basically says, look, we're going to seize, we're going to take, because that's the only option left, because nobody was handing it to us at the time. We're going to take the legacy of the Apollo program, and we're going to board the ships. We're going to take it on and make it our own, and we're going to do radical things and come up with radical ideas. We're going to disrupt, is the phrase they would use now, and then move into a new realm. We're going to take the ship in the direction we want to go, and new ships. So the pirate flag just became a thing. And it's kind of fun. I have a tendency to wear black quite often anyway, so what the heck. <laughs> you know, it, it, it really is. It's just for fun. It's, it's, you don't want to examine it too deeply. We did actually fly a very small pirate flag that I had bought at Six Flags um, on the mirror. Yeah, I remember seeing that in the movie. Yeah, and it was funny because the Russians, uh, the cosmonauts, see the skull and crossbones in a very different way than we do. You know, they didn't see the movies, you know. They didn't see Errol Flynn or, uh, you know, or you know, Pirates of the Caribbean or whatever the same way that we do. Um, they, uh, they didn't like it. They thought it was an omen. So, we had, uh, you know, we paid them a little money and they, they flew it up there. Um, so at the end of the day, all I got was the pirate flag and a, you know, and a lapel pin. <laughs> we had a space station and that was all I got, you know. That's more than anyone else can say. I mean, you had a space station for nine months. That's pretty incredible. Even today, you have only a very select number of governments who can, who can say that and, and they call on the International Space Station right now, which of course is maybe $120, $30 billion worth of cost so far. Uh, uh, but but, but let, me, let me go kind of again to that original bug and, and to another very pertinent question that you often speak about, and that's the why. Because one of the criticism here uh, by, for example, uh, one of my previous guests, uh, who is a, a well-known inventor and uh, the founder of the Venus Project, uh, Jacques Fresco, he, uh, for example, says, 
uh, that we have more important things to do. We have big problems that we have to resolve here on Earth. And until we solve all those issues here, like conflict, starvation, environmental disaster, wars, you name it, then there's no point of us going in space because all we're going to do is just we're going to export our problems from here to space. So the wars that we have here now will just become Star Wars. But we're going to have the same issues and the same problems. So let me ask you this. Why space and why now? Don't we have bigger issues, more important issues here on our planet to resolve before going outwards? Exactly the reason we go. You've just made the argument for me. And so did your guest. How so? If we went with that logic, why go somewhere else when we have problems right here we have to solve? You and I would be having this conversation in our cave, <laughs> right? Um, and we would be hopeful that the elders wouldn't be uh, wanting to kill us for talking sacrilege because they're in control of the cave. You see, the reason we go to new places, the reason we do new things is because we are dissatisfied with the way things are. If we accept the way things are, then why ever do anything new? That's the exact argument. Look, you can argue to some degree that we have, uh, you know, that we're beasts and, and we have screwed everything up. And, you know, if that's the case, you know, when people really get extreme about that, I just want to hand them a gun and let them kill themselves. Just, just shoot yourself right now and we'll solve the entire, entire problem. Because if we're that bad, we don't deserve to live. I'm actually an optimist about human beings. I like humanity. I like life. And I believe that only a few tens of thousands of years after we have become, shall we say, civilized, we haven't gotten it all figured out yet. It's going to take a while. And we are getting better at it. Some people have this very jaundiced, very narrow view of things that doesn't really look back in history at the way we actually were. But we really are less savage than we were, right? You probably don't have a barricade around your house to protect you from the tribe down the street. <laughs> probably don't have children who would most likely die in childbirth and not make it, you know, to the level of uh, being able to go to school or anything. Oh, and you, you actually have a school. Yes. And you're sitting in an air conditioned building talking to me on another part of the continent using technologies that wouldn't have been developed if somebody hadn't been dissatisfied with the technologies of the day. And you live in a culture where you actually get to vote on who's in charge rather than accepting the divine right of somebody who was appointed by God because they were bigger and could carry a larger sword than the person next to them. If you accept the status quo, you are doomed to stay within the status quo. And frankly, time moves forward. And if you are staying within the status quo, you're actually going backwards. So yes, we go to new places, we do new things. They don't always work, but sometimes they do. And inch by inch, centimeter by centimeter, we become better at being human beings. Yeah, as I often like to point sometimes is, is uh, all progress stems from the fact that, you know, usually the children are rebellious and they don't want to follow the ways of, of their folks, of their parents and grandparents. And they want to try new things and do the old things in a new way. Uh, and, and that's how we have progress. And of course, people say, well, if Jesus, if, if a donkey was good enough mode of transportation for Jesus, then why would anyone else w want anything else, right? But, but again, because somebody had, 
you know, the, the audacity to consider different modes of transportation, then eventually we got cars and airplanes and now spaceships, uh, etc. right? Because if we get satisfied with the donkey level and if, if we say that God was fine riding a donkey, why would you want anything else? Then we'd never make any progress, of course. You got to quit handing me the easy ones. The fact is that Jesus himself was a revolutionary. He may have ridden a donkey as a symbol, which we all know if you think about it, but he was a revolutionary. So it would have been, well, if Caesar was good enough for Jesus, you know, well, he wasn't. Jesus spoke whole new ideas. He challenged the status quo and he paid dearly for it. A lot of people who challenged the status quo paid dearly. The point is, without an edge for people to go to, the center will come apart. What do I mean by that? I mean that you have to take your new ideas somewhere new. Where on earth can we go now to try the next thing beyond democracy that doesn't hurt the earth? There are a lot of people that want to go under the oceans or settle on top of the oceans. But the fact is, the carrying capacity of this planet, I believe, is being seriously jeopardized right now. And there's really nowhere to go that doesn't belong to somebody else to try your new form of government, your new form of social interaction. We don't have anywhere here to go do it. Okay? I mean, yeah, there are people they want to go over and take out, you know, take over an old oil derrick and declare a, uh, a seastead or something like that, and that's a good experiment, but you're not going to get real far with that. And the footprint, the technological footprint that you're putting out there in the ocean, I believe, is something that I would rather have outside of the precious bubble of life. Nikolai, what, what very important point I want to make here. Okay. A lot of the discussions we are going to have, or like your guest brought up, are discussions that occur before the paradigm shift. And they don't make sense the day after. So things like robots versus people, things like, um, you know, why are we going out there when we have problems down here? They would have made sense the day before we started redefining things. But see, I'm not defining things in the same way, so I can't have that same discussion. For example, I'm an environmentalist, and I'm a technologist, all right? I believe in industrial free enterprise, and I'm a tree hugger. Oh, and I'm in Texas, so I carry a gun. I, I, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> you know, it's a different combination of activities. I went door to door for Greenpeace as a kid. I've got the credentials, you know? Um, I'm totally, I love life. I love living things. And I believe that it is our technology and our capability that at this moment of shift, rather than being forced into a place where we're attacking what we might call the ecosystem using these technologies, for the first time ever, ever, we can use these technologies to expand life. It will be rockets, rockets that were designed to destroy, that will carry the first trees or the seeds of the first trees to the moon and mars it's a complete flip you know before copernicus i could have sat at a party in vienna with my little wig <laughs> and i would have been sitting there and i would have been oh yes it's probably 15 angels per orbital sphere necessary to move venus around the earth and everybody and the chicks and everybody would have thought i was like awesome they would have thought i was like the smartest dude in the room because i was expounding on all of these things the day after copernicus i would have looked like an idiot to say those same things all right we are going through that moment in time right now as we exist you know, there are a lot of people, I, I, your, your radio show is called The Singularity. Um, I do sometimes call it the serendipity, but that's a whole different story. Uh, the, the singularity is right now. It is right now. A singularity in the sense of 
the flip, the tipping point, as Malcolm Gladwell would call it, um, isn't in a cultural sense something that happens instantly. It's taking, it's going to be within these decades, the beginning of the point of time where rockets could be launched to destroy other people and potentially sterilize the earth to the point in time when those rockets and computer systems are able to carry life to worlds that are now dead is the moment of singularity for the human civilization, right? That's the change when all things come together and it flips. Now, it may be epitomized in the future, but that's the moment. People are going to look back at this 50 to 100 year period as the time when civilization changed. Let me grab some of those points here and perhaps hand you another easy one. Go for it. Because the singularity is really kind of characterized by acceleration and sort of uh, ever increasing progress that we cannot keep up with. And some of the criti critics have pointed out that that has been true for most other sp spaces and in industry except for the aerospace industry. And the argument, the classical argument given by those people goes something like this. Look at the biggest sort of child posters from the aerospace industry. We have all made, we have made regress, not progress on all of them. So take, for example, the Concorde was the pride of, of, of aero uh, design 60 years ago. Now we're not flying the Concorde even anymore. We don't have even supersonic flight anymore. And we used to have it 50 or 60 years ago. Take then the shuttle. We used to have it. We don't have it anymore. We don't have an alternative. We only have the Soyuz, which is like 60 or 70 years old, for God's sake, they would say. They would say, look at the moon, the Apollo program. We got there 40 years ago, and we even lost the ability to, to even get back there, let, let, let alone to go even further. So, so how do you address that, that? And by the way, one of those critics is, is Peter Thiel, for example. Okay, all three of the items you just mentioned were either government or government, own, uh, largely government owned and subsidized activities. Okay, they were almost every one of the ones you just mentioned. The shuttle for sure, the Apollo program for sure. Okay, they were designed by government for government ends without the correct why being answered. Well, the only programs that we have functioning in the moment, they're all still government, like the Soyuz is definitely government, and that's the only way we can get there right now. And the International Space Station is also government, they would say. And the, 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 the multiple attempts made by people in the private business have not led to any success so far, at least. They're trying, and they're trying very hard, but they've come into a culture that's been dominated by this sort of government approach so that the, the way it is structured, the, the laws, the, the costing of it. Um, now, I want to be very clear, space is hard, all right? But we haven't spent the time since Apollo. By the way, I want to be really clear. When Kennedy created Apollo, he knew exactly why he wanted to do it. He had the why question answered, and that's the key question. The why for him was to get to the moon and create a photo opportunity of Buzz and Neil, you know, like a selfie of these guys on the moon, which would show that the American system was better than the Soviet system. That was the whole reason of Apollo. That was why all the billions of dollars were spent, and they did it. It was a magnificent achievement that had a very clear rationale. Now, there was no answer to what do we do next that was laid out. Nobody had a, well, why would we go further? Or why do we do this now? Uh, you know, what's next? So they did the right thing for the wrong reasons. That's a good way to put it. They did a magnificent job, and those people are incredible. And I know a lot of the astronauts and the people that worked on it, awesome people. They did an amazing thing. They had a clear direction, a clear rationale, and a very clear goal. Here's the goal. Now, since then, there hasn't been one. 
And without one, what happened was there was this aerospace industrial uh, complex that Eisenhower warned about that was created to go to the moon. Once we got there, that machine existed. And the politics behind it are very simple. Lyndon Johnson, who followed President Kennedy when he was shot, took NASA and put it in all of these important states around the United States. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that we would get to the moon without the program being killed. Well, the flip side of that is when you have no program, you've still got all those centers, they still have all the political control, and you can't kill it, and you can't change it. So what happened was we moved into this thing called the space shuttle. Now, very interesting point is that it was during that period of the 70s that our cause got really started. Because we had Dr. O'Neill saying, let's go out there and build cities in space. And we had this thing that was going to fly someday called the space shuttle. Right? And this thing was going to fly 50 times a year. That's what they told Congress. 50 times a year. It was going to be $100 a pound to go into space. That was amazing, man. You could, do, you could build L5 cities in space. So we thought it was coming. Well, obviously it didn't turn out that way. I think the most it flew one year was five times, something like that. It actually kept the cost artificially high. And by the way, you now had a constituency of senators and congresspeople and lobbyists and aerospace companies whose interest was in making sure that that money kept going. That money, as much as possible, kept flowing. And so all of the structures, and it's very, see, you can look at the surface of this and go, whoa, you know, but the really, if you get down into it, and it's not glamorous and it's not easy to understand at times, but if you get down into it, the political systems, the very way they paid for space projects, you know, there's a thing called cost plus. Okay, the way that you pay for a space project in aerospace, in the old way of doing things, is if I want to have a cup, by the way, here's somebody making money off of Mars, Occupy Mars, right? Um, but if you want this cup designed and you're a government person, you say, you know what? I'm going to have you build me a cup and I'm going to pay you 10% of whatever it costs you to design this cup. And you get to keep that as your profit. Well, if I could design this cup for $10, $10 um, that means I get to keep a dollar. Why shouldn't I charge you a million so I get to keep a hundred thousand? All right, that's how you get million dollar toilets, by the way. It's also how you get 120 billion dollar space stations. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got that kind of money coming in and you've got that kind of sweet deal going on, why would you ever want to have the cost come down? Why would you ever want to create a system where a guy like an Elon Musk can come rolling in and undercut your prices? So you're saying it's the incentives were all messed up? Absolutely. All of the incentives were there to keep people out. The fact that the success of Apollo was so magnificent created a culture of what they call the right stuff. And the right stuff was government employees acting within a command economy socialist framework to carry out work for you, right? And so all of this kind of mitigated against going further and doing more. The fact that nobody after Kennedy said the new goal is for us to go into space and expand civilization and settle the frontier, all right? That didn't happen. So what has changed now that this can happen? A lot of things, and they've, they've just started to be manifested. Now, for all of those years, um, in the late 90s and up till now, you've had these organizations like the Space Frontier Foundation, Space Access Society, uh, National Space Society, all these different activists who are a bit nerdy. They're not like rock stars. They're they really suck at PR sometimes and things like that. But what they have done is they've walked the halls of Congress and they've helped change the laws. We had to change the laws. It's been a long and bloody fight. 
we had to create the, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong, the Space Launch Services Purchase Act, which told NASA they have to buy commercial. Uh, you know, finger by finger, we had to pry the fingers of the old established <laughs> off of space so that it would be released so new ideas and new approaches could come in. And that was what happened. Elon Musk didn't just like show up one day, you know, and say, hey, I sold PayPal. I'm going to go build me some rockets. All right. He got into it because, yes, he wants to go to Mars. And we should not ever forget that. But he got into it because a lot of people behind the scenes had spent many, many years really sweating. Laying the path for him. Absolutely. Exploding the landmines, getting things out of the way. The fact that we did the mirror, for example, and showed that, uh, you know, because the government, here we go again, you know, we were going to fly this tether. The government wouldn't let us fly the tether. All right. They said it's a technology. Uh, you know, we don't want it falling in the hands of those evil, I don't know, Canadians. I don't know. They didn't want somebody to have it. And so because we didn't have that technology, we had to figure out a way to pay the rent. And we had a meeting and we said, you know, maybe some guy would buy a ticket. And I had lunch with Dennis Tito and I had lunch with Jim Cameron and Tito put up a million dollars and that led to him flying and all of that. All right. So that helped send a signal that, huh, maybe somebody would buy a ticket. Maybe that's worth something. Um, there were other people doing other projects. The X Prize, even though it didn't work perfectly, did send a signal. Okay. Um, there were other companies out there trying to do things that shared the dream, but we had to create a clearing so they could do it. Now, a lot of people looked at the end of the shuttle and said, oh, my God, it's all over. No, that's the beginning. That's the beginning. That was the big tree that had so much shade, the little trees couldn't grow up under it. Very nice way to put it. Well, you know, it's unfortunate that we had to fly with the Russians Uh, I love the Russians. I worked with them in Mir. And, and it's unfortunate, that, though, that we had to buy tickets there. But that was because of Congress. Congress knew perfectly well, you know, it was under George Bush that he signed the deal that the shuttle was going to be ended. And they knew it was coming. But Congress and the lobbyists for the aerospace industry, rather than setting things up so this guy named Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, or these other guys could undercut their prices, rather than giving him that market, they forced a situation where we had to fly with the Russians. They, the Russians was a safer bet for them than allowing an upstart American who would compete with them to come in and do it cheaper. That's how, com you can't look at, you know, anybody who's ever, there's like this TV series on right now, Uh, about Carnegie and all of this on the History Channel called The Men Who Opened the West or something like that. And it's about Edison and Carnegie and all these people. If you look at the surface of these things, you don't get what's going on underneath. Think about how cutthroat that is in a sense, right? We would rather, we're American companies and American lobbyists, we would rather have the Russians flying American astronauts into space than allow somebody who's going to compete with us to get a foothold and force us to do things differently. That's what happened. Now, we're moving into a different period and it's starting to shift, but that's really what happened. So you have to really um, look at it and, and understand that we are in the beginning of something new. It's crude, it's bumpy, it's rough, but if we can come back around and answer the question why and get on the same page with the government and the aerospace companies, and the SpaceX's, and the Jeff Bezos's, we can do something really incredible. Excellent. That's my next point. So it's, it's a very good lead. So is the New World's Institute aimed at providing that why? The New World's Institute, for me, um, is going to be looking at what you do after you have the why. And let me come back for just a second on that. Um, As I said, there have been a lot of battles fought to, to help get these companies flying, um, and a lot of people fought a long time. A few years ago, 
uh, we had a very critical vote in Congress that basically was the last major vote prior to the funding that allowed SpaceX to fly to the station. And around that time, I came back to Texas for personal family reasons and to also try and work on changing the climate here in Texas. That gave me a little bit of time out. And it was quality time for me because I actually got to work on my father's land. I got to put shovels in the dirt and walk around and see the actual stars at night and be a real Texan. I, I am. I'm, I'm a British Texan. I, I'm an English kid from Texas. Uh, but the country, being out there in the world and, and seeing it and feeling it kind of got me back in touch with why I'm in this. Um, and during that period of time, I started looking at, you know, SpaceX, Jeff Bezos, they're going to they're gonna make it or not now. We, the baby has been born. Those of us, I'll use the, since we're talking to, the gunfighters have, you know, helped protect the baby long enough that it's growing now and the baby's flying. So they're out there now, they're starting. And even the aerospace companies are starting to come around and I'll come back to that in a second. So I want to focus on where they're going. Mm -hmm. See, one of the easy fights we all have is what kind of car we're going to drive to get where we're going. Is it going to be a government car? Is it going to be a, a, a dragon? Uh, or is it going to be a Sierra Nevada? Or is it going to be a this? Or is it going to be this? They're all going to Disneyland, and they're all worried about what car they're going to take to get there. I wanted to start focusing on Disneyland. Okay? What is the destination going to be like? What are we going to do there? Or an economist might say the economic pull function. Rather than pushing, lowering the cost of getting somewhere, you make the somewhere so attractive and so real that this starts to take care of itself using market forces. So I started looking at the why. And I really started getting back in touch with why I do this. Why do I care? Yeah. Um, and that really got me very introspective. And I realized that the reason for going into space is, is bigger than anything. I mean, I... It's so cool because we're in a field where I get to actually say that. It's like bigger than anything. Yeah, I mean like the universe. <laughs> we're at that level. We can have a conversation at that level. This is about the universe and humanity and why we exist and why we're intelligent beings and how we got here and are we the only ones and all of those questions roll into this. And when I look at that, I realize that, yeah, we've been fighting these battles and these technologies and, and all these other things all these times, but there is a grand purpose here. There is a grand route ahead of us. There is a, a grand goal that we can achieve if we do things right. So I started putting together the New Worlds Institute in parallel with Deep Space Industries. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to get out there on the frontier and start figuring out how to utilize it and how to create a culture that utilizes it. And so that's where both the company, Deep Space, and the New Worlds Institute come from. They're not related directly, except through me, but that's the goal. How do we, how do we engineer the pilgrims? What do I mean by that? I mean that, let's say you were in England in the 1600s. Yeah. It's the beginning of the 1600s. And there was a guy named uh, Elonius Musk, and he was building a thing called the Mayflower X, you know, and it was going to go to the new world. And you knew it was going to happen in about 15 years, which is when he and Bezos and these other guys say they're going to get us off planet and go, go to moon and Mars. If you knew that was coming, how would you engineer the culture of people the pilgrims, who could take that boat, go to the new world, and survive, and what tools and knowledge would they need to make a, a go of it? And I decided that's what I was going to do with the New Worlds Institute. So are you to prepare and or train and or equip 
materially or philosophically or otherwise the the people who are going to be willing to take on that trip? Yes, and the first step, interestingly, was it's funny because you can have like a great idea and you can sit around brainstorming with people and this is really cool, let's go do this. And then what happens is you realize, oh hell, I have to do this other thing first. Oh, and then I have to do this other thing. These are not really exciting, but you got to get them done before you do what you're doing. So the first thing we did was um, we decided to answer the why question and create a commonality with people on the why. And it was a very funny moment. About two years ago, I called up a guy named Bill Gerstenmeier. Bill is in charge of human spaceflight for the United States. He's got, I, I guess, a $9 billion budget or something like that. He's the guy. He's, he's the guy in charge of anything we do with space station and astronauts and stuff like that. Now, Bill had been on the other side of the largest rocket project that NASA's ever done, the, what they call the Space Launch System. That was the one that's been fighting to some degree against SpaceX. The senators have, you know, it's like, it's, it's a ridiculous game of, well, all the money has to go here, but we can't, so we can't give these guys any and all this. I was on this side fighting for it. In fact, I was one of the guys that made up the term the Senate launch system. <laughs> all right. Um, and so what happened was having stepped away for a while, I was able to, kind of get a new perspective. I got on the phone. I called up Bill Gerstenmeier. I said, Bill, I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm done. This is sort of like what we did with the space station back in the 90s. I said, We're do I'm done fighting. All right. Elon's going to fly or he's not going to fly. It's going to be up to him now. There's the momentum is happening. The baby is born. Why don't we start talking about where we're going, Bill? Why don't we not fight? I'm not going to write any more editorials on the Huffington Post or testify any more anything against SLS. I'm going to focus with you on the destination. And we had a great conversation. It created a clearing for a new way of talking to each other. And so we started talking about our passion. And once you sort of engage in a new way of talking with somebody, it gets into you and you start doing it more and more and it starts to be a new approach. So a few months ago in Washington, I rented the Reagan Center uh, building or a, a meeting center, a meeting room in the Reagan Center in Washington. And building on what I had with Mr. Gerstenmeier, I reached out to, we ended up with 110 people from all sides of the space community in a room together to talk about why we go. And we had vice presidents and, and leaders of um, ATK, which builds the rocket motors for the shuttle, um, Boeing, these things have been set in print, so I'm not saying anything new. Lockheed Martin, um, SAIC, Aerojet. We had the advisors to the Romney campaign. We had the advisors to the Hillary campaign. We had NASA people, we had scientists, engineers, we had people like Jeff Grayson from X Corps, everybody in one room, astronauts. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos? They were not there. And I'm glad they weren't. They would have been too disruptive. We, 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 you know, but we had representatives from SpaceX. Mm -hmm. um, and we had representatives from um, Bigelow. We had representatives from all these. We had Buzz Aldrin. Um, he was a handful all by himself. I love Buzz. Um, but everybody sat in this room, and we had workshops. We had, a, we had a poster in the back of the room that I'll have to send you. It had a rocket, and then it had the red cross, the band sign over the rocket. They said, no launch vehicle discussions allowed. ha. <laughs> Everybody in the room was banned for two days from arguing about rockets. They also couldn't talk about whether it was the moon, Mars, or free space that was their favorite thing, and they couldn't talk about their political parties. You take all those things away and you strip all of that away, and now you can get down to having a conversation of why are we all here? Why are we into space? Why do we give our entire lives to this cause whether you're working for Lockheed Martin, whether you're working for SpaceX, 
you have the same dream. And at the end of the, three, the two days, we got a consensus of the people in the room. At this, it was called the Pioneering Space National Summit. You can look it up. And we got, oh, and by the way, we banned all reporters. And I'm sorry to your profession. <laughs> I love you guys, but these people wouldn't have been able to speak freely if we had had reporters in the room. Some of the bloggers went absolutely nuts. They went crazy because they weren't allowed in. Um, and I'm sorry, you know, we had to get work done. And at the end of the two days, we had a consensus. We were able to put up on the screen a declaration and then people voted against it. We had this system, thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. And we took votes and then we worked on it. Then we took another vote and another vote and another vote. In the meantime, people went off and worked in working groups. This wasn't a conference. There were not a lot of big speeches. And then they would come back and they would put reports up on the screen. And we worked our way through. And on the end of day two, we had a consensus across the board of people who agreed that human settlement is the goal of the United States space flight program or of the human space program. Human settlement. Human settlement. And that it is best enabled by public-private partnerships and international partnerships working together. You can find it on spacedeclaration.org. Okay? We had nine different organizations that were co-sponsors, by the way. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to have one organization come out with a declaration, because that never works. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're pretty goofy in our field. You know, it's like, if I say I wanted to do this, and you go, well, hold it, that wasn't my idea. That sucks. <laughs> oh, you want that kind of rocket? I want this kind. Oh, you want to go to Mars? No, I'm going to go to the moon. You're an idiot. Yeah, we, we can't do that. So perhaps now is the moment to talk a little bit more about that human part of the settlement, right? Sure. And you previously very quickly just briefly touched on the, the issue of robots versus humans. Right. Tell me a little bit more about that. Why, why are you pushing so much the human end of things? I mean, the classical argument goes that, especially in the singularitarian community, that everything that has been done by men, or most everything that has been done by men previously, is being done or will soon be done better, faster, cheaper by a machine by a robot, by an artificial intelligence, by a computer, you name it. So, and also those are cheaper. And when they die, we don't make a big fuss about it. So, they also have more durable hardware. They can take a lot more G's than our, you know, meat bags can. And therefore, the sort of the, the box around them, the, the possibilities for them going outwards are much bigger and better. So why are you insisting so much on the human end of things? Number one, because I am a human. If I were a toaster, I'd be arguing for machines. <laughs> But number two, if I want to go dig a hole and mine some resources, I can send a machine because it is cheaper. Um, if I want to do some research and, and take some pictures of something or get some samples, I could probably send a machine. Uh, it'll be slower, things like that, but it'll probably be cheaper, and especially if it's a dangerous place. But do I want a machine to go listen to a symphony for me? Do I want a machine to go to an art museum and, and look at a da Vinci for me? Do I want a machine to look into the eyes of my baby and have those feelings? No, I'm a human being. That's what I do, all right? I smell the flowers. I dream dreams. I am the creature of spirit. I am the one who feels joy, happiness, hatred, disgust, the craving to explore. That's what I do as a human being. Machines are just the extensions of my fingers and hands. They are not a part of my imagination and my soul. And that's why I want to see human beings go. Robots first, people follow. 
Well, that's that's perhaps the best way to 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 put it forward, I think, and it's also the most poetic way, uh, and it's also kind of the best emotional hook you can come up with, because I, I can appreciate that you want to be there at, at at the edge of the symphony of of the galaxy, or or the birth or the death of that star, or or whatever it may be, and and that's really poetic and, and powerful image. However. Let me push you on it a little bit. The idea is that we can overcome and, as Ray Kurzweil says, transcend the limitations of our biology one way or another, whether we upload into the machines or uh, into robot bodies, especially when it comes to space flight at the, at near the speeds of light or even beyond the speeds of light, if that's possible, then the idea is that the, the smaller our footprint, the faster we can travel, the further away we can get to. And therefore, our biology, which may or may not be our humanity, actually, that's a whole other separate debate, but our biology becomes the limiting factor because it, it, as I said, it's not very durable, it requires a huge footprint, all kinds of protections, all things and requirements which you can avoid entirely if you have, for example, a bunch of mind uploads in, in a spaceship the size of a Coke can, where everybody is just r running whole brain emulations, and then you can beam that across the universe at a much lower cost, probably much higher velocity, and you can get further than if you actually have full human beings. At that point, look, you're, you're crossing into... I'm going really far off, yes. And, it, and it's fine. If at the end of that voyage, at the other end, there is a human being, in all senses of the word, human being, in that that person feels joy, all of the things I mentioned before, and, and can be a part of that uh, in terms of being an imagination rather than um, uh, simply a ones and zeros digital entity. Yes, as Einstein said, imagination is more important than intelligence. So I agree, and that kind of goes right to the very meaning of what is to be human, which is kind of one of the reasons why I started my blog, trying to answer that question and how it changes in the context of this accelerating, disrupting change and explosion of potentially artificial intelligence, because the very meaning of what is to be human would change. And right now it's kind of a, a, a synonym, humanity is a synonym of biology, but I believe that would change. And Ray Kurzweil says that human, human is this which transcends its current situation. We kind of agreed with that a little bit when we talked about progress. Human is that which pushes progress, which is never satisfied with that which we have been given by our ancestors. And, and so provided we can keep those elements, I don't see a reason that we should be so attached to our biology per se. And, and you can still dream, you can still imagine, you can still have the poetry at the edge of the universe. I'm not disagreeing with that. I really don't disagree with it in that sense. When we talk about humans versus robots, the debate that people are having right now is a different discussion. Their discussion, their discussion is one versus is exploration versus settlement. Yes. All right. If those intelligences in that Coke can are going out there to live and to make of that a new domain and all of the other things I said regarding it being their home that they're going to live there, they're going to give it to their children, if they can have children, hopefully, uh, things like that, that's a different approach or a different discussion than an exploration discussion. An exploration discussion, you can argue that having machines at the current state of what we call machines, see, we can have a fantastical debate about fantastical um, aspects of things that is important to have and, and worth having. But at the same time, right now, the debate of humans versus robots is a different discussion. It's a different debate. It's a different level, yeah, absolutely. These are people who say people shouldn't go into space. Mm -hmm. 
in whatever form right now. And you made a very poetic defense, uh, which I entirely agree with, as to why we need to, because of course our current robots are nothing as to what I've described in the real, really long run, which of course is not not guaranteed by any means, and only people like Ray Kurzweil say, say that, or the transhumanist and the singularitarian community generally believe we even have the chance of getting there. And, and so perhaps now is the time for me to muddy the waters even more and, and bring in the topic of the book that you're working on, uh, which has this kind of very sort of interesting title, uh, working title at least, called God and Rockets. <laughs> Yeah. So let's I, uh, we we talked about space exploration, humans and robots. Let's and rockets. Let's throw in God now. <laughs> okay. Um, Why God? Why do we need God in this picture? Because an atheist like me says, "Look, we have quite a complexity right now already, and we can explain most other things without God. God's only going to complicate things, in my view." Why are you bringing him into the picture? Him? Uh, well, anyway, look, I, I think that uh, I'm using the word God in this sense of uh, the, the, uh, I'm using the word God in a different sense than, than you're talking about. Sure, it. tell us about it. Um, I'm, I'm not saying this is some, uh, some angry old dude, you know, who's throwing lightning bolts down at, uh, at, at people that have the wrong family structure. You know, I'm not talking about some, some people running around in white robes on Mount Olympus or somebody whose picture can't be drawn or they'll blow up your house. I'm not talking about God in that sense. Okay. I am talking about God in the interactive sense of our relationship to the universe itself. I am of the belief that the reason we are here as sentient beings, is an act of inter, or is an interactive act of uh, interactive act. I am of the belief that as human beings, as sentient beings, we are here as part of an interaction with the universe that makes the universe alive, and that without us to see it, touch it, taste it, feel it, interpret it, laugh at it, yell at it, enjoy it worship it, whatever you want to call it, that we do, that interaction that is unique to a sentient feeling being when it encounters physicality. Without that, the universe, in a sense, doesn't even exist. In other words... It's a very Barclian po point of view. A very what? Barclian point of view. The yes. philosopher Bar Barclay. Yes. It's a point of view that basically says... Without the perceiver, in essence, there is nothing to perceive. Essay percipi, I think, was the original yes. uh, thing he said. Yeah. The concept here, though, is very, um, and, and there's a real argument for it. If, if there is nothing, nowhere, anywhere, anybody, anything that can perceive that thing that's being perceived, does it exist? Right? And it gets into all kinds of interesting uh, verbal and intellectual paradoxes to have even the conversation. But then we are that gut that you're referring to, aren't we? Because we are the ones who perceive the universe. So without us, there would, it would be dead. Therefore, we bring life to it with our own existence in our uh, emotional and intellectual perception of it. The best kind of interview is when the interviewer actually makes your case for you and you've just done it. Okay. You've just spoken my word. All right. That's exactly my point. All right. Without us, the universe is dead. Now, when I say us, I mean sentient beings. There may be somebody else sitting there talking to their own Nikolai somewhere on the other side of the universe. In another dimension. Uh, yeah, you know, and again, we can push the conversation so far that it's meaningless. 
Uh, I'm all for other dimensions, but right now they don't really have an effect on, on what I'm doing that I know of. Maybe it's brown matter. Who knows? You know, but or brown any dark energy. Um, I don't know. But the point is that we have a role. Oh, by the way, I want to be really clear. This is all just because I say so. This is just because I say so. I've decided I make the declaration myself because I have the power to do that. As anybody does who chooses or creates any other belief set ever, I have declared this for me. You can share it with me. You can be a part of it. You can interact on the outcome of it with me, but you don't have to have it. I'm just saying that for me, a universe wherein my job is to protect the incredible life of this planet, to take the civilization of this one sentient being, that the only one that I have proof of anywhere ever, and expand the life of this planet and the domain of this sentient being's culture that I'm in beyond this world so that it can live and grow and explore and expand, that makes sense to me. And I want that to be the cause of my life. And I would love it if it were other, the cause of other people's lives and they felt the same way because I think what's out there right now what we give um, as the rationale for being the why am I here answer is hollow. It doesn't provide the excitement, the passion, the beauty of that feeling that I get when I truly contemplate and engage in and get into the space, all puns intended, of this answer. Why am I here? to protect, cherish, and expand the domain of life to worlds now dead, to carry the light of life to worlds now dark, and the eyes, hands, and imaginations of humanity to places unseen, untouched, and unexplored. That's beauty to me. I was going to say, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's the statement of the Earthlight Foundation and the New Worlds Institute. That's why we exist. Now, imagine a world in a world, as they say in the movies, in a world. But imagine a world in the future where a child grows up in a culture that rather than being dominated by cultures that were basically started in, um, you know, 3,000 years ago, the answers to their existence come from this interaction with the universe that is based on the knowledge the science, the understanding that we have now. See, the idea of, look, I, I could, the idea of like, let's go start a faith, because really what we're talking about is the faith that this is all based on. There is some missionary element for sure in what you're saying, right? That kind of mission to go outwards, to go to the frontier, to push it further out, right? That's, that's what missionaries do. Missionaries of life, missionaries of imagination. Sure, sure, yes. All right. And the beauty, by the way, of it this time is this time we get to go together. I'm not going to go arrive on the new world and discover people, much to the chagrin of those people who didn't know they needed to be discovered <laughs> and then wiped out. I'm not going to go do that. Um, I'm not going to do it based on an elitist approach where you have to have billions of dollars or be a government employee. I want us all to go together. All right? I want to share this. And when we get out there, I want to share the wealth and the abundance that we create with those people who decide to stay behind. But I want us to go because I believe that that is a great goal. Look at the world we have right now. We're passing off to the next generation this idea that we've screwed the planet. It's over. You get to clean it up. You're going to make less than we did. You're going to have less opportunity than we did. That's the message. That's an awful message. I want to turn that message around. I want to flip it around. Word picture here for a second. The future we offer is one of less and less and less opportunity. <laughs> when you open the frontier, it goes this way, and it becomes more and more and more. That's the future I want to create. That's the future I want to offer my children, my daughter, that you, you should want to offer your child, your daughter, your kids, that's a different approach to tomorrow 
than any philosophy that's out there right now. And by the way, it's based on science. It's based on the best possible understanding of where we are and, and what we are right now. It takes the tools that we would use to destroy ourselves and turns them into tools of creation. It takes the motivations that some people find as destructive enterprise, things like that, and turns them into the tools that allow for beauty and art and life to expand and grow. It flips everything on its head. It's a Copernican revolution. In fact, it's bigger because it causes actions that change the, the actual ecosystem and expand it beyond the earth. It turns the guns not into plows, but into ships. Yes. Yes. It takes the rockets of death and turns them into the ships of life. It gives us a whole new way of looking at the universe. And by the way, if at some point we evolve into new creatures, look, a person on the moon is going to have a different evolutionary path. They're going to get taller. They're going to hate the earth because there's too much gravity. I call them homo lunaris. <laughs> there's going to be people in space, uh, homo spatialis, that are probably, all of them, by the way, are probably going to have higher radiation tolerances than we do. Um, they're going to want to evolve to a point where they have minimal spacesuits so their genetics repair, the chromosomes repair faster, things like that. Or get rid of the bi biology altogether. Or, that was where I was going to go, the next step is maybe they load themselves into a toaster and they go. You know? <laughs> But it's, it's still being human. You know, it's still about being human. It's being able to have that smile you've got on your face right now and appreciate a joke. All right, or an irony, or or things like that. It's you know, it's it's the thing that uh, um, you know the robots on Star Trek are always trying to become human. You know that kind of thing. I mean, that's fine. I personally like the soft, squishy stuff. You know, I like the soft, touchy feely thing. But what the hell? If you want to go out there and load yourself into a can and go, fine. It's the going. It's the going. It's the enjoying. It's the Let's have a conversation about it. Let's bitch about things or laugh about things together and we'll be human. Well, that's, that's in the really loading ourselves into toasters or cans. It's in the really far off future. So let's talk a little bit more about your own timeline and benchmarks. Okay. How do you see yourself, let's say, and your work in, in that whole space in the next, let's say, five years and beyond? Let's talk about the first within the five years and then beyond. The New Worlds Institute, um, our goal is to bring together people with um, different approaches to dealing with those technologies and systems that we will need to live off planet. If you were having a house built, there's a thing called a punch list. All right. And on the punch list, you've got this thing that the people building your house have to get it all right. The light switches the electrical, the plumbing, the paint, the roof, they have to check it off. We need that for space. Whether we're going to Mars, the moon, or free space, we need a punch list. We don't have it, all right? So that by the time Elon and Bezos and whoever else shows up is ready to take us, you know, whether Mr. Thiel actually you know, decides to put some money into something valuable and go do it the right way, or somebody else jumps in, or You know, there's a rumor that there are several billionaires who might want to fund a moon base. When they're ready to go, we've got to learn how to do it. We have to have the technology. And, and it, it, it gets down to some, it's literally, I mean, literally, nuts and bolts. What kind of nuts and bolts do you use on the Mars, on Mars or on the moon? We need to know that. Look, my whole thing, and, and you might be picking this up just a little bit, my whole thing is to dream up here and then to get really pragmatic down here. The reason I got into Mircorp or Lunacorp or Orbital Outfitters, I have a spacesuit company in Midland, Texas right now that's doing spacesuits for X-Corp um, or, or Deep Space Industries where we're going to go mine asteroids. The reason I do that is we have a saying here in Texas, if you're going to talk the talk, you better be able to walk the walk. That's why in my introduction I called you a visionary, an evangelist and a trench warrior. <laughs> I appreciate that. The trench is uh, an interesting analogy. Um, but the fact is that we, um, um, we need to learn these basic things. A, what are the machines and technologies? What does a moon base look like? 
you know, what does a Mars base look like or facility that's going to grow into a colony? Um, what do those things look like? How do they operate? Also, creating the culture of people that are going to be comfortable operating and living within them. So that begins to create, as I said, how do you engineer the pilgrims? Well, those people right now are probably nine, 10 years old, all the way up to us. And I want to start working with them. Uh, we're going to have an online system called the uh, Space Development Matrix that was actually being worked on years ago by one of Dr. O'Neill's um, associates. The idea there will be that we could go online and let's say you wanted to work on a, uh, a drill bit for using on uh, ice on the moon. And you wanted to find out who's working on that, how far along they are, uh, what part of that can you work on. So you go into the matrix and you dig down into it, and we have things called TRL levels in space, technical readiness levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a TRL one through nine is the scale. Okay, everybody in the space field uses this. TRL one through three means it's like a theoretical concept. Three through six means it's being tested in the lab. Six through nine means it's being applied in space. Mm -hmm. All right, so we would apply red, yellow, and green to that. So you go into the space development matrix, you go into it, you dig around, and you see if anybody is down in there uh, working on lunarized drill bits. If nobody is, you drop in your abstract, you drop in your concept, and you drop in how to contact you. And then people can talk to you and say, hey, and now you've pushed it. And now you actually maybe come to, we're going to hold a conference, by the way. Our first conference is um, this fall in Austin. Mm -hmm. um, it's the New World's Conference. Um, in the room, I'm creating, I'm basically creating what Dr. O'Neill did. You know, he used to have these conferences. We used to call them not ready for prime time conferences. Uh, because you could walk into these conferences in the, uh, in the early 80s, in the late 70s, and you could say, you know, maybe someday somebody will buy a ticket to go into space. <laughs> Nobody would laugh at you. They would laugh at you. Oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's ice on the moon. And people would go, oh, really? Well, that was where a lot of us got started. Because Dr. O'Neill created a community for us to be able to have these dreams with him. You know, and that's where Diamandis and I met each other, or Pete Warden, um, the guys who work in Washington, Muncie, all these other people. We all met each other in this orbit around Dr. O'Neill, who created what I call permission to dream. Uh -huh. All right. And through us, it started going out there. You know, there was a guy named Jeff Bezos who had a little book club, and one of his books was called The High Frontier. And then he went and did this thing called Amazon. Um, you know, Elon Musk showed up at a Space Frontier Foundation conference right after he had founded PayPal, or right after he got out of PayPal. And he's poking around going, yeah, I want to go do something with Mars, you know. All of these kind of go back to this thing, and he created that community. Well, in our ecosystem in the space world right now, we don't have that community, and I want to create it again for the next generation. So we will have an internet presence that's interactive. People will be able to vote like they do on Reddit at the level of, okay, this technology you're working on, is this something we need in the first 10 years of going to the moon or Mars? Or is this something that'll wait? Like a space elevator isn't something you're going to do early. You'll do that later. You know, those kinds of things. So that conference is going to have a very serious core where we're going to have people present their ideas. Now, the first one this year will probably be sort of a showcase but starting next year, we will invite papers. I want that kid from New Delhi to walk in and go, I think I will call it the wheel. And all of our heads explode. It's like, holy crap, it's the wheel. That's what we've been waiting for. There was a kid in Egypt that came up with some engine concept that blew people's minds a year ago or so, I read. And they, they even had some early, very early signs that it may even work. But it was like totally incredible right and we need to, we need to create a place where these ideas come together and then and where they exist on the internet in between and people can collaborate maybe there's somebody working on it using my drill bit thing maybe there's somebody working on a drill bit for mars 
And this is a little different, but you guys can get together. So then we'll have the conference. Now we want to build outside of the conference with a festival. One of my friends said we should probably call it the New World's Fair. Um, and the idea is to grow something where, where we have art, science, engineering, and people start celebrating and working together and building that culture. Now, that's five years from now. This will start generating. Moving into 10 years, what I would like to see is the same culture now starting to come together as an identifiable community. All right? Um, a people who have a shared faith. The pioneers. Yeah, pilgrims, pioneers. People who believe it and live it. The settlers. It should happen. Pardon? The settlers. Yeah, or, or what I might call an earth lighter. A person who believes that it's, we shine the light of earth and living on other worlds now dead. Those people start coming together and working together to create different activities. Now, this gets a little out on the edge here, but why not have these people start developing habitations here on earth? Like there was a thing many years ago called biosphere. Yep. All right. They screwed it up. They, they didn't do it right. They lied. They did some things that were incorrect. Um, I kind of knew there was a problem when they put a desert in it. It's like, what? You know, you don't put a desert in a biosphere that is supposed to be generating life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a desert is basically an ecosystem that's collapsing. You know? and, and you want one that's rich and, and all of that. That's just my opinion. But what about if you had people who were starting to put these pieces together and that they had set a goal within their community of closing their system more and more and more. All right? So now they're taking the technologies that they're developing and they're selling them and they're creating, like if we're going to be extracting water from the sands of Mars, why can't we apply that technology to the deserts of the Sahara? Okay, why can't we do these kinds of things and then take that funding and put it back into creating this community that it can afford now to buy the Mayflowers to go to Mars and the moon, mm -hmm. right? So we start creating an economic and philosophical community that's closing more and more and more to the point where, see, here's, here's the point. If you're going to go put people on Mars and they've got to live, wouldn't it be better if they've been practicing for 10 years on the earth? Yep. All right. It's, and it's little, it's little things like I was talking about the punch list where you're doing your house. You know, the idea of paint. You know, if I paint my house and it starts to outgas and vapors come out of it, what do I do? I open the door. I can't do that on Mars, right? You're dead. Okay, we need cultures where people are comfortable with that. We need cultures where kids are growing up here on Earth, before they go into space, when something breaks, they pull out their duct tape and their little Arduino and their Raspberry Pi and they whip it together and they program it and they put in something new, stick that sucker together and boom, they've just saved the day. And it comes as easy to them as changing a tire on a car comes to us. That culture has to be created before you get out there. See that the technological difference in culture that we have with a space culture or a survival culture is very different from that that the pilgrims had when they went to the new world. In other words, they already knew how to plant crops and to take care of chickens and to make butter or to build or repair a roof. We've moved away from that. We need to get to the technological equivalent of being able to fix the roof on our space colony and have it become as natural as jumping out of the car and grabbing the, the wrench and starting to change the tire. Okay, that culture has to grow now while Elon and these other people are building the rockets so that we intersect when the time is right. And along with that comes the government systems, the legal systems, the the culture itself, maybe some art and music moves in there, and we got people ready to go. But they're starting on the earth, preparing to go out there. 
That's absolutely fascinating. Rick, uh, let me ask you this. Are there any fundamental misperceptions or some kind of general confusion that you encounter about space exploration very often that really bugs you and that you want to clear out? <laughs> um, I think that people who think that this is, uh, this is rich boys and their toys, all right, um, what they don't understand is what they're witnessing is the beginning of this gigantic revolution in human history. And that these are the people that just happen to have the money to do it and grew up inspired by that culture. You know, it's not an accident that Elon's vehicle is called the Falcon. All right. He grew up watching astronauts and Star Wars. You know, and he was inspired. He made his money. He's come back and he's doing this. He could have put his money into basketball teams. <laughs> he could have, but he's doing this. Um, that's important. The people understand what they're seeing here is not that movie uh, uh, Elysium. That the rich are going to go up there and the poor are going to stay down here. Uh, I want to make sure, in fact, one of the things, you know, at our conference this fall, for students um, and, and just regular folks, I'm going to get in trouble for this because we haven't locked this in. It's going to be like $15. Wow. That's all we charge, right? You don't have to pay $20,000 to come to uh, Rick's Space University colloquium, <laughs> have, you know. It's 15 bucks a day to come. You know, unless you're a corporation, then we're going to charge you more because you've got to make up for it. But, you know, we need to let regular people get involved. And we need to create access to people so they can interact. Now, what I need is those people that have the funding, the Peter Thiels, the, the Elons, the Bezoses, if I haven't insulted them all too much yet, to uh, come and help us do that so that that kid from New Delhi has the chance to participate. That's important. The other perceptions, that you have to be a government to do this. The other perception, the one we talked about earlier, we have so many problems down here on Earth, why should we go into space? <laughs> it's just ludicrous. It's like we have so many problems here in the cave, why should we go down the valley? You know, it's, it's ridiculous. That's why we go, to create new opportunities and new chances to do new things in new and different ways. Um, what else? What other perceptions? Um, you know, there is a perception that some people in the aerospace community have that I'm against aerospace community uh, companies, that I hate the corporations and this and that and the other. Look, those are people doing what they do for their own reasons um, and, and to make a living. If they get on board the right way, come on in. The fact is, if we are able to turn this into something valuable and viable, they're going to make, you know, it's going to be Boeing that's going to be out there building the spaceships. You know, it's going to be those companies that are out there working just as long, just along with everybody else. Um, so that's fine. Um, what other perceptions? Um, Let me throw in a, an audience question here, and we kind of touched on that, but you kind of said that we may be the only living creatures in the whole of the universe. Callum Chase, my previous uh, interviewee, who is a science fiction writer, submitted a question asking, what is your favorite explanation for Fermi's paradox? That so far it's all darkness and silence everywhere we look at. There's no other living, uh, intelligent, technologically advanced civilization that we can see or, or see any signs of. Yeah, this is the one that, that really screws with people's heads the most, I think, at times. Um, human beings are lonely. We're very, very lonely. One might argue, I'm not an atheist or an agnostic or anything like that. One might argue that we created gods so that we wouldn't be alone. And when 
and and when you know and when gods didn't work we we created mythical elves and dwarves and there's always something beyond the firelight all right and we create it so that we 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 don't have that sense of aloneness and it does come back to that core question of why but you know so i think that it, it's not an accident that in the high tech age of today we've created et all right E.T. is the modern version of an elf or a fairy. Uh, uh, it's just a high technology elf or fairy or angel. I mean, think about it. He comes in with a glowing finger and he comes in on a glowing ship and he beams on a beam of light. I mean, it's very ethereal and angelic. We don't want to be alone. Therefore, we want desperately for there to be other civilizations out there. We want it. We crave it. We need it almost at a core level because we don't have that why answered. And it's a substitute for that. But what if we're not, what if we are alone? What if we don't exist in a universe full of life? And what are the reasons for that? Well, first of all, I think they're probably, I think there's a good argument for there to be life out there. You know, the whole billions and billions of stars, Carl Sagan thing, you know, billions of stars. Mathematically speaking, people would say the odds are staggering that against the, the claim that we have to be alone. Chances are somewhere, some planet, some system has life. I mean, g given the... It's not impossible, of course. Well, I'm not going to argue against life. It's the... It's spacefaring civilizations that we're not finding okay advanced technological civilization but there may be a billion worlds covered with algae out there all right there may be a billion worlds or a hundred million or millions and millions of worlds that have dinosaurs or ape-like creatures there may be millions of worlds that have civilizations that are operating in stasis that have just sort of stabilized and never gone into space. There may be worlds out there where they reached for space and they fell back down. All right. There are the reasons I would look at would be one, um, that they got out there and they collapsed. Self-destruction, nuclear war. Environmental collapse. The U.S. Congress. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty mundane, but look, we went, to, we went to the moon and we stopped, right? Why couldn't there be a civilization that did something similar and then pulled back down because there were so many people on the ground going, why are we putting all our money into going into space when we have problems down here? <laughs> all right? So there, you're going to check that, that civilization. You're checking that one off the list. <laughs> maybe, maybe there are, you know, look, there are so many levels of potential cataclysm that it can occur. All right. On top of the odds, you have to have a planet that occurs in what they call the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. You have to have a planet that's orbiting a sun that has the right combination of metallic compounds that's being produced by the fusion within that sun and spraying those out into the solar system so they end up on those planets. You have to have an orbit that is around a planet that is stable enough. I don't know if a binary, and we believe a lot of solar systems are binaries, I don't know if you can get the stability in the orbital uh, interaction as far as climates go without that, um, with that kind of variation of a binary star. You also, um, if you have to have a moon from what we see, from what we, you know, we have to go with the experience of what we got, so you have to have a moon that's about the right size in the right place to do the right things. By the way, the moon takes a lot of the hits that the Earth, if you ever looked at the far side of the moon, it's taken a lot of the hits that could have taken out the Earth. So then you have to have the debris and bombardment issue that occurs in the right period of time at the exact right moment of the evolution of the solar system. All of that has to occur before you even get to the point of the building blocks of life. All of those things have to happen. Oh, and by the way, you can't have a quasar, not a quasar, but you can't have a cosmic event that sends radiation out that sterilizes the solar system 
at any point during the growth curve of life. So that knocks out a huge chunk because that happens all the time out there. We're always spotting them. You can't have a nova that's too close by. Um, there may be forms of radiation and other interactions that occur in space that just go through like waves and sterilize everything that they hit. We don't even know about that. You know, the ant that gets stepped on has no concept of a boot. <laughs> Until the moment of impact. So there's all of that going on. All right? Now you're just getting to the point of being able to have life. Now that life, keep in mind, the original organisms on the Earth were in an environment that would be poison to current life. So they had to go through that cycle of transforming the planet. You had to have the liquid core that was interacting in the right way, et cetera, et cetera, moving along. And most of your listeners already know all of this stuff. Now you're moving along, you're getting life. Now the life is starting to evolve. Well, then you had to have um, land so that the life would move on to the land because if it lived under the water, then you're not really going to get to the point of things like fire. All right. And then you've got a whole different approach. And then uh, the sky becomes the top of the surface tension of the water that you're living under. All right. Now that's those people probably or those creatures, whatever they were, maybe don't make the jump. All right. So in a completely water world. So now you've got creatures moving on to the land that evolve into creatures that um, make it through another set of, you know, they have to have a, a certain uh, cataclysm occur that causes new species to rise up like the dinosaurs. But it has to be enough to knock out certain things and to allow other paths of evolution. So are all those things kind of very lucky coincidences or are they, is there something more that's going on? That's my point. I don't know, but that's, let's come back to that in a second. Sure. So that's my point. You're getting all of these things. So all the runners in the race, in the race to being the planet that has sentient life that can fly into space and create civilization, they're all getting knocked out. One by one by one by one. Very, it's interesting how few people, everybody runs around going billions and billions of stars, life must be everywhere. There are very, very few studies that have looked at all the possible things that could knock life out. Almost, there are very few that I know of. I can't even think of one off the top of my head. There are very few out there that say why things might get knocked out. Why? Because we don't want that to be true. All right? And so you get all the way through this, now you get finally to the point of civilization starting to rise. Now, what does civilization do? Civilization can go in different directions as we see. The, by the way, the civilization has to all, what if it's all on one continent? What if you have a world with just one continent? Now, what kind of civilizations do you end up with? All right. What if it's all like one place? Or what if they're so separated that they, they don't encounter each other for a certain period of time? They rise and fall without ever even knowing the others are there. There's all kinds of interactions. Now you've got civilizations. They get to the uh, weapons, germs, and steel uh, uh, level. And now they're starting to, to grow and take off. Now, what if uh, the religious uh, control gets so strong that all forms of uh, thinking, let's say they never come out of um, the Dark Ages, right? Now they never come out of it. They just stay there because there's no interaction because they're all civilization is on one place. So now those people, they're out of the race. And it goes on and on and on. Now you get to the point of they're developing the technologies uh, because they're at war. All right. right. Now they go to war and they wipe each other out. Okay, those guys are out of the race. Now these guys come through the war and they've got some technologies that they could use to wipe each other out. But along the way, some of them have caught on to the science bug and they want to go look out into the universe and see what's happening. All right, now they, those people are starting to make the leap out there. But along the way, like I said, somebody says, well, we shouldn't spend our money on that. Let's go the other way. Let's stay on the earth until, on, on, on planet Zoogly until it's perfect. <laughs> okay, so the planet Zoogly people, they're out of the race. All of that occurs. Now, all of this occurs, by the way, within the framework of the current concept of the origin of the universe as being the Big Bang. The Big Bang postulates that the universe was all created at the same time. Therefore, the evolutionary path 
of everything in the universe, the galaxies, the solar systems, the planets within those solar systems have all occurred within the same time frame to reach the same point at the same point in time from the origin. So four billion years, you know, the earth, and now you're getting into da, 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 da. So that somewhere within, you know, a billion or a hundred million or whatever has to have occurred throughout the universe. So now you've narrowed that window. The number of runners is smaller now as far as technological civilization. So that window causes, so now you get down to, we've made it into space. But by the way, the same technological civilization that's allowing us to do that has at least a half dozen ways or more that it can kill itself. All right, because we've developed the ability to put germs into the atmosphere that could wipe everybody out. We've developed the ability to press a button and send nuclear weapons and wipe each other out. Now, we may not be gone, but we've knocked ourselves back down from the climb. Um, on and on, all these different things we could do to wipe each other out and come and fall off of the race. So maybe, so now you're getting down, I believe, to relatively few. You may still have a few thousand out there or whatever number. I'm not a mathematician, but I, it gets narrower and narrower. We're talking about a very much narrower racing uh, field. Okay, now maybe they've got the, and I made a joke about it, maybe they've got the same Congress we have, all right, here in the United States, the same world governments. Oh, because while they're developing the ability to go in space, they've started to cause a climate change. And they're not paying attention. You know, it's like, it's like Game of Thrones. You know, they're all fighting with each other and winter is coming. You know, except in this case, we're all fighting with each other and summer is coming and it's not going to be good. All right. So while they're on their way to opening space and creating a space civilization, their climate is changing and they don't happen to pull it off fast enough and they get wiped out and they go into a runaway greenhouse situation. And then they never make it. There's all of those possibilities as to why they may not be there. And I want them to be there. I would love for E.T. to be out there. I want to sell them cheeseburgers and, and, and have, you know, go talk about our relative experiences and what music is. But maybe they're not. So what that tells me. Oh, and then there's the other one. Maybe they are. And just by coincidence, we're the first ones. Just by a chance. Maybe the first ones to get to that point. Or they got there and they moved on and transcended, loaded themselves into the Coke cans as intelligences <laughs> and shot themselves out somewhere up and don't care anymore. All right. So all of those possibilities can occur. When I look at all of those I have to look at the cards I've got in my hand. And the cards I've got on my hand are this one planet and this one civilization and these amazing forms of life and beauty. I'm looking out at trees and a dog chasing a stick right now and somebody playing, things like that. That's what I have to care about. Now, maybe I'm creating a useful fiction. But the people who say that life is everywhere are equally as guilty as creating, of creating a useful fiction. I have no evidence, no proof of anything except this planet, this civilization, my will to live, and my desire to move us off of it and expand life. So are they out there? I want them to be. I pray for them to be. But I have to bet on the fact that they're not, in which case... This place is pretty freaking precious. We better take care of it. And I think it would be cool to expand it out there. Fantastic. Rick, we've been talking for over two hours now. So unfortunately, I have to bring our conversation to an end. But for those of our viewers who would like to follow on your work and start following you in general, what's the best place or way to do that? Ah, well, um... By the way, we didn't talk about deep space industries, but we could do that another day. Um, but the, um, the best way to do that is right now, uh, I'm at, at Rocket Rick 
on Twitter. Uh, my personal website is offline, but it's getting ready to come back up in the next few weeks. So it'd be rictumlinson.com. Um, and then the New Worlds Institute. And it's newworldsinstitute.org. We will put up the conference uh, information probably in the next three weeks or so. We'd love people to come down to Austin. Oh, and also, if you're in Europe, um, look up hashtag Mars on Facebook. That is a local meetup that a guy named Daniel Gaspers and his team have started. I was there two weeks ago. In Amsterdam? Uh, in Amsterdam, Delft. Delft University. Um, they're getting rolling. And lastly, um, there's a thing called Crossing Borders um, in uh, The Hague uh, this fall. I'll be, uh, the New Worlds Institute is going to do a session there. I think we're calling it uh, uh, Open Source or Crowdsourcing the Frontier. Mm -hmm. uh, because we want to start having people interact with each other and actually building things using open source. I am always looking for volunteers and experts in those areas to help us, and we would be glad to hear from you. So, uh, look, you've done a great interview. You've been very patient with me. I really appreciate it. No, Rick, uh, it, the pleasure was entirely mine, but we have one last question to address, which may be perhaps the most important thing, and it's always the same question I ask at the end of my interview, and this is we've covered a, a very huge spectrum of topics today in a very long interview what's the best way to wrap it all up together and perhaps send our viewers send our audience who stuck with us for those two hours with the most important thing in your view what is the one message that you'd like them to take away from our conversation today we are here to go there now do something about it. Fantastic. Rick Tumlinson, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.